Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about chronic fatigue, or mono, other known as Epstein-Barr virus. So let's get right into the details. So chronic fatigue, mono, question mark, Epstein-Barr virus. Mononucleosis is an increase in a certain type of white blood cell called monocytes. Okay, that's where mono comes from. The most common cause is Epstein-Barr virus, or it's other known as herpes virus 4, or HHV4, okay? So it's actually in the family of the herpes virus. Other causes for elevation of monocytes, or mononucleosis, can be cyclomegalovirus, adenovirus, toxoplasma, rubella, hepatitis A, and HIV. So when you suspect someone who might have uh, mono and the Epstein-Barr virus test comes back negative, it can be one of these other causes. So the Epstein-Barr virus is positive or what we call seropositive in 95% of the adults. Okay. What that means is pretty much everyone has caught it and has gotten over it. The problem is some of those patients, a small percentage, will have chronic Epstein-Barr virus or chronic reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. And we're going to save that for another video. So teens and adults are the, the main population that tends to get Epstein-Barr virus. So they call it the kissing disease virus, right? When teenagers and adults you know, interact you can get Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is in the oropharyngeal epithelium. What that means is basically the mouth and throat, basically saliva, or even um, just a little bit of um, uh, vapors from your mouth, uh, which has the virus in there. So oftentimes people are asymptomatic uh, in the beginning, and then they will develop symptoms. So, but the problem is here, that the asymptomatic patient who has gotten over the Epstein-Barr virus can still shed it up to six months. So they can still spread it. So that's why so many adults actually have the antibodies for Epstein-Barr virus. Incubation period is three to six weeks. That means you may not even know that you have the virus and then maybe three weeks after exposure, you may start to experience symptoms, okay? So symptoms, what we call the triad of symptoms, three symptoms, fever, sore throat, or swollen tonsils, right? And what we call lymphadenopathy, basically swollen lymph nodes, especially in the cervical chain, in the neck, in the posterior chain. So you have inflammation of those lymph nodes. Other symptoms for Epstein-Barr virus include headache, malaise, muscle, and joint pain, and then occasionally, actually, um, with the spleen, about half the people will actually have an enlargement of the spleen. Okay? It can become very you know, big and then it becomes an emergency and you end up in the hospital and all that stuff. But you have about half the population who have Epstein-Barr virus in the active form may have an enlargement of the spleen or splenomegaly. A small percentage will also have liver enlargement or hepatomegaly. And then when they take an uh, MRI or uh, CT scan, sometimes you can see this where you have the enlargement of the organs. Now, how do we test for it? Okay. The traditional test when you go to, let's say, an urgent care, wherever you want, uh, and they want to test for mono or Epstein-Barr, so they do a mono of spot test. It's a IgM and they use uh, sheep's uh, red blood cell. It's called a heterophile antibody test. The problem with this test is there are a lot of false negatives during the incubation period, that initial three to six weeks when you have it, uh, you develop a little symptoms, and, but you may not show on the mono spot test. It'll be a false negative. Now, when they do turn positive, it only turns positive for like 80% of teens and adults. And in children, it's only like 40%. So they can have Epstein-Barr, 
right? And they don't know they have it, or they have mono, but they don't know they have it because it's only positive in like 40% of those who are positive. And only 20% in, in the ages uh, less than four, okay? There's another test called PCR, polymerase chain reaction test. This is a little bit more expensive to do. And what they do is they look for a qualitative, meaning they're looking for the presence of DNA of the virus. Is it there or not? Do we have it or not? Number two, they do a quantitative test, and this is the viral load, the amount of the viral load in our body. So those are the two tests. This is really not the best test. This is a little bit more expensive, and it can kind of tell you that you may have it or not. What I like to do is something called a viral capsid antigen test, along with an early antigen antibody test, and an Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen antibody, which is EBNA. When we take these tests, we can find out if we have a active infection, past infection, or reactivation of an old infection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a separate video on this test and give you an idea of how to figure out if you have activation of an old Epstein-Barr virus. This is going to be a very important lecture for those people who are chronically sick or chronically have issues with fatigue, malaise. Okay? We're also going to connect the Epstein-Barr virus to Hashimoto's thyroiditis or thyroid conditions because the Epstein-Barr virus uh, has been known to trigger autoimmunity in patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So I'm gonna leave that for a separate video. This is gonna be a very important video in part two. Today we're gonna to talk about Epstein-Barr virus testing. How do we determine if you have an acute infection, past infection, or you have a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus? This is very important because some people will have chronic Epstein-Barr virus issues and cause chronic fatigue and health issues, and sometimes it'll impact the thyroid, uh, impacting Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So let's get right into it. The Epstein-Barr virus, you're looking for antibody testing. It's called viral capsid antigen IgM antibodies, or VCA for short, and it will show up in the first exposure up to four to six weeks out, and then it'll disappear. VCA IgG antibodies appear in the acute phases and peaks around two to four weeks, and then it will persist for a lifetime. So it will show up once you've had it for your lifetime. There's something called early antigen, EAD antibody, and this uh, uh, shows up in the acute phases of Epstein-Barr and tends to disappear. However, in about 20% of the population, this antibody will persist and will be detectable for several years or some people for a lifetime. Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen testing, or EBNA antibodies, appears when acute phase is resolved. So you're out of the acute phase of the Epstein-Barr virus and it develops two to four months after the acute phase and it will persist for your lifetime. So this one and this one will, sh will persist and show up in your blood for your lifetime. So how do we determine if we have an acute infection? How do we uh, determine if we have a past infection or an activation or reactivation of the virus? So listed above is the individual test that we just talked about. So if you come and we test a patient and they're negative for all of them, okay, this first line, negative, that means that person has never had the infection, okay, and they don't have any acute infections, right? So they never had it and don't have the infection. They're susceptible to getting Epstein-Barr, okay? When you have a positive IgM, IgG, and a negative, negative, you're going to have an early or primary infection, right? Because you have IgM that goes up initially. When you have a positive or a negative here, positive, positive, negative, that means it's an active infection still going on. 
Now, when we have a negative, so this is when hap the acute phase is, it shows up, this disappears, and then you have a positive, negative, positive, that means you had a past infection, okay? So this is where it gets a little tricky. You have a negative here, so the past infection is gone, initial infection is gone here, and then you have a positive, positive, and positive, and that would typically um, indicate a reactivation of the virus. The only problem is that in this section here, you have 20% that might have persistent levels that are elevated after the initial infection. So you have to look at the clinical signs and symptoms of someone who comes in and determine if they have a possible reactivation. So if you're suspecting a reactivation, it's positive IgG, positive early antigen, and a positive EBNA, okay? When you have these three, you can possibly have a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus. Now the question is, how do we get someone healthy if you know they have chronic virus issues? It's not really about just killing a virus off. It's about building your immune system, right? Things that are good for your immune system, things like sleep, reducing stress, eliminating those factors that create issues for you like smoking and alcohol and all the other things. So lifestyle factors are very important. And I've made other videos on viruses, so I'll go ahead and put that link up. And uh, in terms of building your immune system, you have to have uh, proper lifestyle factors in place first before taking on all the nutritions and nutraceuticals that would help your immune system. I'm very excited to deliver this lecture. We're going to talk about infections, whether it's viral, bacterial, or parasitic infections. How do we distinguish what type of infection that you might have? I highly suggest you stick around till the very end where I give you my clinical pearls. Here we go. Infection, bacteria, virus, parasites, white blood cells. So you can test in the blood what we call a complete blood count and with differential. Within that differential, you're going to see white blood cells. So white blood cell or leukocytes are made up of two different types, granulocytes or and agranulocytes. Granulocytes are neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, which are produced in the bone marrow. And agranulocytes are monocytes, lymphocytes, which monocytes are produced in the bone marrow, lymphocytes are produced in the spleen, thymus, tonsils, appendix, lymph glands. Now, you need all the organs that you are born with, right? So don't randomly remove your tonsils or don't randomly remove your appendix. If you can keep them, keep them because they're part of the immune system, okay? Here we go, white blood cell. We're gonna give you what we call conventional lab values. And these are what we call functional lab values, what I consider optimal, okay? White blood cell, 4,000 to 11,000, okay? Com uh, functionally, 5,000 to 8,000. Neutrophils, 35 to 70% is your conventional lab. Functionally, 40 to 60%. Lymphocytes, 20 to 40. Functionally, 25 to 40. Monocytes, 2 to 8. Functionally, 4 to 7. Eosinophils, 1 to 4. Below 3, functionally. Basophils, 0.5 to 1%. Below 1%. Now, I'm gonna go over each individual ones when they're elevated or decreased, right? They're not perfect in terms of, you know, accurately diagnosing a problem. We're gonna give you clues as to what might be going on, and then if you need to, you need to follow up and do advanced testing to figure out exactly what the problem might be. But this will give you clues as to what type of infection you might have.
Now, this board is written up and it, there's a lot of information here. So let's go uh, step by step, line by line. When you have a decrease in white blood cell count, your leukocytes, your total white blood cell count, if you have a decrease, it can be related to a chronic virus or a chronic bacterial infection. Okay? Other reasons why it can be decreased, it's immune suppression like HIV, AIDS, autoimmune disease, lupus, decrease in bone marrow function or bone marrow suppression, antibiotics, pancreatic insufficiency, even a raw food diet could decrease your white blood cell count. Pancreatic insufficiency is about where you don't have enough of the digestive enzymes and sometimes the white blood cells will take over that process of what we call phagocytosis, a breakdown of the foods. So white blood cell can be depleted if you have pancreatic insufficiency. White blood cells that increases, right, above lab levels, even functional levels, means acute infection, inflammation, allergies, even pregnancy at the late stages or giving birth, your white blood cell count can go up and it will calm down after you give birth. Tissue damage, muscle tissue, it can be surgery. So you can have an increase in white blood cell count. Increase in neutrophils can be related to bacterial infection, inflammation, okay? A decrease in neutrophils can be bone marrow suppression or viral infections. With viral infections, you're gonna have an increase in lymphocytes and a decrease in neutrophils at times. Lymphocytes, when they're increased, can be an acute viral infection, can be inflammation. When lymphocytes are low, it can be a bacterial infection or a chronic infection. It can be oxidative stress. Monocytes, it's elevated when you have end-stage infection, so you're getting better, and monocytes are things that come in and they clean up what's left over. So at the end of an infection, you can have an increase in uh, monocytes. Sometimes it's associated with intestinal parasites and benign prosthetic hypertrophy in men, okay? Monocyte decreased could be related to steroids, Eosinophils that are elevated is related to asthma, intestinal parasites, allergies, whether it's food or environmental, okay? Eosinophils that are low, steroids or adrenal dysfunction. Basophils, increase with inflammation and intestinal parasites. So that's a lot of information, right? There's a lot of ups and downs here, but I'll step away so you can actually see this board and you can have an idea of what's going on. So here is the clinical pearls. If you see a elevation, let's say here, white blood cell count is elevated and you have an elevation of neutrophils, that is an acute bacterial infection. When you see white blood cell count with increase in lymphocytes, that's an acute viral infection. Oftentimes with acute infections, where you have elevation of white blood cell and neutrophil lymphocytes, you're gonna have the opposite with the other factor. So, if you have a bacterial infection, you're gonna have an increase in neutrophils, and initially, you might have a decrease in lymphocytes. Same thing here. If you have an increase in white blood cells, with increase in lymphocytes that can be acute viral, but you can also have a decrease in neutrophils right in here. Number three, a decrease in white blood cell count with an increase in neutrophils. That's usually a chronic bacterial infection. The key here is that you have a low white blood cell count. So someone asked in the comments, how do you know if you have a chronic infection? You have a low white blood cell count with an increase of the marker that's elevated for the type of infection you might have. In this case, bacterial. Over here, you can have a decrease in white blood cell count with an increase in lymphocyte. That's a chronic, chronic viral infection. Okay? So these are just general rules, clinical pearls. Here's the last one. 
if you have an increase in monocytes, an increase in eosinophils, there can be a high probability of intestinal parasites. Okay, so this little section right in here can help you determine whether you have a, an acute or a chronic infection, whether you have a virus or a bacteria or a intestinal parasite. So this little chart right in here gives you an idea from a very simple blood test to determine if you have an infection. Now, like I said, it's not a perfect way of an analyzing this, but it gives you a great uh, first step as to discover what the underlying mechanism might be. So if you see that your white blood cell is low and you have slight elevation of neutrophils, there could be bacterial overgrowth. So you might have to go and discover or dig to see if there's bacterial overgrowth somewhere, maybe in the GI tract, right? Or if you have increase in monocytes and eosinophils, parasites, then you might have to do a stool analysis to see if there's infection in the GI tract. Usually monocytes will be greater than seven and eosinophils will be greater than three with parasites, all right? So that's my clinical pearl. I hope this was a, uh, a fun lecture and an important lecture really for all those people who have infection, okay? My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.